Wow. Thanks, Dr. Mills. I know that I look very much forward to all of your leadership as the rest of the SAM leadership does as well. Um, and now, it is with my great pleasure to introduce to you our Dr. Peter, Peter Rosen Memorial Keynote Address Speaker, Dr. Cheryl Heron. Okay? Dr. Heron is an MD, MPH, is a national leader in emergency medicine and has more than two decades of experience related to diversity, equity, and inclusion with a current lens toward justice in emergency medicine. Reflecting on the past, Dr. Heron will discuss the history and importance of, of justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion, also called JEDI, and, it has, and how it has expanded over the past several decades. Current data notes that there has been a minimal change in underrepresented, upper, underrepresented in, my, in medicine, or URIM, at the student, resident, and faculty levels. The importance and visibility of URIM across the lifespan of EM cannot be underscored enough. The scholarly activity related to JEDI and academic emergency medicine is inclusive of health inequities as well as the link to the physician wellness and belonging. Dr. Heron will examine how recent events in the nation have highlighted how much further we need to go to ensure equality, fairness, and justice for our patients, our colleagues, and our community. She will also cover strategies to consider to create a more, more unified, diverse, and inclusive culture in academic emergency medicine. Please welcome Dr. Heron. So good morning, everyone, and I am hoping we can get our slides up here. Let's see. Oh, mercy. You look fancy. All right. So, <laughs> uh, so, so first of all, I want to thank you, Dr. Bean, for the introduction. And I want to thank Ava and Marquita for compelling me to submit this application for the Peter Rosen Address, which I have to say, I was overwhelmed by that. So to start off, my name is Cheryl Heron. My pronouns are she, her. I am of Jamaican heritage, and I honor my parents who died last year. But it's all good, because I'm a strong woman of faith, and I stand here to really talk about, while we say Jedi, I'm not a fan of that. It's really about diversity, equity, inclusion, underscored by justice. Justice, which should be the foundation of all we do. Justice for how we should be accountable. So, as we move forward, or not, <laughs> mm. my man in the back, can you help me out? We're not advancing. All right. So there's a running joke that happens with the good Dr. Heron that I am known, and my family in the front here at Emory, that I am the IT not person. I've actually shut down Delta uh, before. Not proud of that, but that's what happens. So here are my disclosures. I won't belabor it. I do have two textbooks for which I receive a small honorarium, partnering with Dr. Marcus Martin, as well as Dr. Lisa Moreno Walton. But we want to talk about the objectives, as we should in all talks, which is really to consider and define diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice in that order, not Jedi, it's not Star Wars, but in that order, why does it matter? And specifically around health equity, the impact of racism over these last few years, and more importantly, to think about how to apply best practices to move us forward in accountability. So it's really a matter of a conversation that I would hope we all have, not just today, but going forward, on what we mean by these constructs of diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice. Who does it impact individually, collectively, our community? And how did we get here? Why are we talking about this in 2022? Why does it matter? And more importantly, how we move forward. So I want to commend Drs. Laundry. And Dr. Brown, congratulations on the Marcus Martin Award, sir. 
for bringing definitions to the forefront in this publication in the SAEM Pulse earlier this year, commending them for highlighting racism, but bringing us to the definitions that we all must be aware of and cognizant of when we have these conversations. And I'm not going to belabor what they say on the screen, but I want to highlight in each of those definitions words we should all resonate with. The diversity meaning the individual differences of what you see, what you don't see in who we are as individuals, our ethnicity, our culture, who we are in how we worship or not. Health equity, everyone has, everyone has the opportunity for health. Inclusion, highlighting the need to be active, intentional, and ongoing in our engagement of this practice. Justice, like equity everyone has, but injustice everyone deserves. And accountability for all of you to be obligated. Obligated to explain, justify, and take responsibility for these constructs. So we're going to start with diversity. And I want to commend the good Dr. Boatwright for his paper and study. You deservedly, deservedly got the Young Investigator Award because we talked about what that looked like when we worked together to think about how far we have come and next steps for the future. We've heard the data that tells us we haven't moved the needle that far in terms of the representation and diversity, but how does that look? Hola, mi nombre es Yvette Calderon. My name is Yvette Calderon and I am a chair of emergency medicine in New York City. Hola estudiantes, profesores y personal de SAEM. Estoy aquí para enfatizar por qué la diversidad y la equidad y la inclusión con una lente hacia la justicia son importantes. Hello learners, faculty, and staff of SAEM. I am here to emphasize why diversity, equity, and inclusion with a lens on justice matters. We know that diversity in medicine is one way of reducing health inequities. Yet there is still underrepresentation of Black, Latinx, and Native American emergency medicine physicians for over 20 plus years. We know the problem. Now it is time to solve it. I believe it is our moral imperative to implement best practices now. We need to hold ourselves accountable. I will leave you with a quote from James Baldwin. Not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. Thank you. Dr. Calderon, one of the few full professors, chairs, Latinx in emergency medicine, thank you for your leadership because the question becomes, do I belong? Do I belong for who I am, for what I do, for how I do it? And I have to say, I ask myself that question quite often, landing at Emory, the first black woman there on faculty, but then challenging myself when I thought about diversity, not just through the lens of race and ethnicity, but through the lens of all of what brings us to who we are. So I challenged myself in my first <laughs> inaugural role for ADIM, which by the way was 10 years ago, to look at LGBT and our LGBT work. What are we doing? How are we doing? Are we teaching it? Are we not? And the first paper that we published told us that we weren't. We were not providing the adequate amount of education in our residency programs around LGBT health. And thanks to Dr. Mole and his work, from 2014 to 2021, thank you for increasing from 26% to 75% what you are teaching in that space. So I had to learn myself around the equity and inclusion lens, the diversity lens. So let's just talk about that diversity. Diversity. Diversity to me incorporates every possible difference within the beautiful tapestry of humanity. Differences make us not only beautiful, but enrich us and make us all stronger. Understanding differences can challenge, but it's always worth the effort. None of us are perfect, and therefore diversity requires both humility and humanism. I grew up in the late 70s, early 80s, where being gay meant not only different, but AIDS fears, stigma, marginalization, homophobia, and hatred. I stayed hidden and damaged due to differences. When I met Cheryl, she epitomized inclusive diversity and provided me with a way to exercise some of those demons and make a difference for others. We went on to publish the first survey of any specialty on LGBT education 
content at the GME level. We embarked on many presentations, papers, book chapters on LGBTQ plus health together, many sentinel for emergency medicine. Diversity to me means community, one that includes everyone because of differences, equally invested in helping those different than me find equitable lives and health. Dr. Mo, who became one of our past presidents for ADIEM, Dr. Mo, who stepped up and helped me learn and grow and understand. But what we see in diversity and what we don't is palpable and real. How they intersect across who we are has to be grounded, not just in race, ethnicity, orientation, but what about ability? What do we know about educating ourselves and caring for patients with disabilities, working with colleagues who may have disability in the tapestry of what we call diversity? My name is Jason Rattoli and I'm the Associate Program Director at the University of Rochester. I'm also the Founder and Chair of the Accommodations Committee through ADIEM. I need to express my sincere gratitude for Cheryl, Joel Mall, and Bernie Lopez as they have provided guidance, encouragement, and at times gentle force toward accountability in my DEI work. As someone interested in advocating for the Deaf American Sign Language user, I was really fortunate to have Cheryl, Joel, and Bernie show up to one of my first SAEM sessions. At the time, I had no idea who they were and knew nothing about ADIEM. But within three months, and I checked my email to be sure, I joined ADIEM, volunteered to develop and lead this new committee, and to publish a chapter in the case compendium that Cheryl and her colleagues were working on. Now, five years later, our group presents annually at SAEM on improving accessibility and accommodations and has published in the realm of disabilities in emergency medicine. Based on some of our work, we've learned that despite the U.S. disability population being approximately 25%, only about 40% of EM residencies provide education on care of those with disabilities, and that on average, this total about one and a half hours annually. Given this staggering prevalence and obvious mismatch in EM education, I'd like to challenge all of you to expand your definition of diversity, recognizing that some diversity is visible and obvious, and some is subtle and may only be disclosed after interacting with a person. And if you need it, it can be my turn to provide guidance, encouragement, and some gentle force toward your accountability in hopes of achieving justice, equity, and inclusion for patients who require accommodations. Thank you, Jason, for stepping up and stepping in. Because the question is, for many of us, is do you feel seen? And for those of you who are Disney enthusiasts and actually follow Encanta, this struck me when it came out on Good Morning America when this young man from the family Madrigal, saw someone who looked like him. He felt seen, and the family Madrigal talked about what are their gifts. And I would posit we all have them as we advance forward. And from the lens of a black woman, not representing all black women, but certainly being exemplar of one, it needs to be seen. We need to be seen. And the question is, how did we get here? And why are we talking about this? Certainly, the dual pandemics of COVID-19 and systemic racism brought us front and center. But it didn't just start there. It started when we think about the American's legacy of black oppression. It started when we thought about how slavery, reconstruction, and Jim Crow made up more than three quarters of American's history. This year, 2022, which is the year we're in, is a significant moment for us when this is a time where the United States has existed in North America longer than legal African slavery did. So while we think about this equity, diversity, and inclusion work, it will take, hopefully not centuries, but it will take time. But we must engage, because if you think about that juxtaposition of time, when in 1968, the Civil Rights Act was passed after the assassination of Martin Luther King, I want to ask how many of you were alive in 1968? I was, I will confess. But 32% of the population was alive during that time, which tells us that many of you, if not people you are descendants from, have been a part of this history. So why does it matter, the historical import and what we're trying to get to, two seminal Reports from the Institute of Medicine called our attention to that. First, crossing the quality chasm, talked about equity, equitable care. How should that, would that look in terms of providing quality, regardless of one's diversity? 
two years later, 2003, Unequal Treatment talked about bias, stereotyping, prejudice, all the things that will impact and lead to health care disparities. And 20 years later, the question became how far have we come when this agenda for health care quality improvement came to the forefront. And the realities are we haven't come that far because what gets measured gets improved and we have not been extremely well in collecting data. We have not been doing well in bringing in communities' perspectives, community organizations, and the efforts that they entail and highlighting again the barriers of racism, discrimination, this lack of data, and lack of trust cannot be underscored. So health equity really is our ethical and human rights principle that motivates us to eliminate these healthcare disparities. So in the potpourri of diversity, let's talk about equity. Equity. I am Nicole French, Chief Quality Officer at Emory University Hospital Midtown. As emergency physicians, we take pride in our charge as a medical specialty to provide quality care for all patients at all times. Inherent in this charge is the notion that we are providing equitable care for our patients when in fact we may only be providing equal care. Equity or equitable care challenges us to go beyond the standard approach to a chief complaint. The application of decision tools and the implementation of safe interventions to understand the impact of our lived experiences and biases in our decision making. Recognizing how racism and the social norms of dominant culture structure influence our patient interactions and the consideration of the social needs and social risks of our patients to appropriately support their healthcare needs. When are we going to face this challenge? The time is now. Thank you, Dr. Franks, my sister, my friend, for challenging us and to think about what that link is. You did tell us what it is. Let's just talk about racism. We can't not. Double negative, I know, but so it is. Dr. Franks published this paper, and we talked about this in great detail, purposely including the voices of our learners and our faculty, all of whom are of color. And we talked about how the COVID-19 pandemic brought and shed light to what we must do and should do as emergency medicine physicians. How are we responsible utilizing the socio-ecological model, thinking about our individual walk, learning about the history of racism, what we do as organizations, building the workforce diversity that is essential, engaging our community as we know and heard and realized in deep sense of knowledge that needs to happen and engaging in policy. What are we doing to look at the holistic review? How are we engaging in bringing forth the conversation on this? And how do we really define this racism? I had the privilege of knowing Dr. Kamara Jones, who coined this 20 years ago to compel us to think about this. We did Leadership Atlanta together, and I met her and said, wow, that's deep. You want to go there? She said, I got to go there, because we have to talk about this, and we can no longer keep this on the cover. And we know that racism is about systems and processes and structures, not people. It's about the institutionalization of what we have created norms in, how we have interpersonally and personally mediated prejudice and discrimination, and the most painful of which of how we internalize this as histor historically underrepresented groups to accept these negative messages that we are less than or not equal to. So we got to talk about that, and we got to know that racism is a public health crisis, and this became peppered across the stage with the murder of George Floyd and others, black and brown people killed in public, the impact on health, the AAMC putting out statements, the AMA pledging to act against racism and police brutality, the joint statement of the American Psychological Psychiatric Association and the National Medical Association for which I'm a proud member of. Certainly, students, if you are here, your voices matter. One of our students at Emory compelled and engaged the DeKalb County to declare racism as a public health crisis, a student's voice. And certainly in the realm of research where the, the former director, Dr. Collins, apologized under the lens of restorative justice 
and committed NIH in the realm of research to deconstruct and dismantle racism in their policies and practices so that we can move forward in what we're doing. Kudos to SAEM, who also was one of the first organizations to declare this publicly on the sign outside of their national offices. Proud to be a member of an organization that steps up and steps in. And we decided to look at that at Emory. And I want to thank Dr. Law for her leadership. She is a research, can't say the BA word, but she knows what that, y'all know what that means. But she is a research officiando that compels us to look at things. And we said we need to look at how racism impacted us, impacted us as emergency healthcare workers. And this impact of racism, looking particularly on the stress level, was incredible where we sent out an anonymous survey and 260 people responded on the impact of racism on stress by race. And what we found was while many people were overall impacted, 61% or so responding to being impacted in their stress level at a high, moderate, high, or low, moderate rate, the real kicker was 46% of those who identified as black or brown were incredibly impacted by this racism and the stress. So when we look under this microscope, under the lens of systemic oppression, we have to think about it across the constructs of the individual, one's own beliefs that is grounded in conscious or unconscious bias, certainly institutional and structural, as I have mentioned before, but how they interact between and amongst us as individuals so that we can move the lens of systemic oppression forward and out of our existence. But in the potpourri of the DEI world that we get to inclusion, how we move forward has to be grounded in inclusion. Inclusion for all we are and who we bring to the narrative. And I have to congratulate the authors of this paper who talked about this. How are we going to look at inclusion if we don't ourselves visibly engage in that process? This publication spoke to whether or not at least 255 programs in emergency medicine had outwardly visible statements about their commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And less than 25%, at least in 2018, of programs, only 25%, I should say, mentioned this, mentioned that diversity in gender, diversity in racial, ethnic diversity, a statement on diversity, established a diversity committee even existed. So when we talk about inclusion, certainly from the social media and the visibility part, how are we doing? Inclusion starts with our shared mission to bring the best care to the diverse population of patients that we encounter daily. Thus, we must embrace what sets us apart. Gender, race, socioeconomics, age, sexual orientation, abilities, religion, the list goes on. We should use those differences as resources to ask the questions of one another that will not only improve our patient care, but our lives as well. We must hold ourselves accountable in ensuring all voices are present and heard. Only one fourth of emergency medicine residency program websites have diversity and inclusion statements. We must challenge ourselves to highlight our actionable efforts with measurable goals on our websites, social media accounts, and on interview days. I believe in us within emergency medicine to start, and to those that have started to grow, and to those that have grown to sustain a diverse workforce and an inclusive working environment. So I have to thank Dr. Hassan, a student who graduated from Emory School of Medicine. She is now in Jacksonville, and I said, you're going to be chief resident, and she is. So congratulations to you, Moji. We want to ensure the voices of all are included as a learner. We know that you can make it happen, but we are truly at a moment of reflection. And when we look in the mirror and think about where we are and where we're going, the question is, where do we land? And I would posit that we are landing on justice. That's why we started with diversity, followed with equity, moved to inclusion, and grounding ourselves in justice. And justice is pervasive in emergency medicine. But achieving it can be elusive if we are not committed, in the words of Dr. Isaacson, of distributive justice. How do we ensure that the social goods and the access to resources in emergency medicine are delivered in a way that is palpable? Let's talk about that justice. 
I'm Dr. Italo Brown, Assistant Professor in Emergency Medicine at Stanford. Justice of all the tenets is the one that I think is most difficult for people to grasp. You know, it's not written about there's, you know, there's a, an element or a quality to it like air or gravity where conceptually we know what it means, but we don't see it in practice enough. We, we don't hear it kind of broken down enough. Uh, and so what I want you to think about is the duty of a physician basically includes social responsibility and accountability. Our job has to be to break down systems of oppression through the work that we do. I challenge you today. I challenge you to do simple things. Write an op-ed. Educate your peers about actual policies that are bad. And let's take it upon ourselves to engage communities to understand what their needs are and how we fit in the ecosystem of our community structure. There is no such thing as precision medicine without social justice involved. And we can't bring up the conversation of D, E, and I without justice. It's just that simple. Dr. Brown, congratulations again for the Marcus L. Martin Award. He is proud and it is so well deserved as we think about accountability. How are we gonna get there? I know we're gonna get there because that's who we are. Accountability is about partnerships. We sit in gardens together with all different hues of who we are and what we bring. And we know that when we partner together, the hands of the few will bring together the voices of the many. And I'm absolutely proud in knowing that this is grounded in truth because accountability in a time of justice has to be grounded in how we think and how we know our power manifests. We all have power, whether individual or institutionally. We can forge authentic relationships, not grounded in performative ways in which we conduct ourselves. We can ground ourselves in the values and the principles that we know SAEM and we know we must do to forge towards health equity. And more importantly, it's our responsibility to act. For we can talk all day long, but until we step up and step in, boldly and with courage, we will not get there. So here's the homework, back to the chalkboard. My role is, this is you. I don't know, we got educators, we got all kind of folk in here, so my role is, are you an educator? And if you are, I would offer that you can think about diversity, equity, and inclusion, partnering, with HBCUs as we did at Emory, with Morehouse School of Medicine, where we had 115 people over several years when we became a department in 1999, 62% matched in emergency medicine, 32% of whom stayed at Emory EM. Thank you very much, the others went to your shop. So we can be intentional on how we engage in this work as an educator. Diversity. I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, to a middle-class Jewish family, son of an accountant and a school teacher. Topics of diversity and inclusion were not hallmarks of my upbringing and not a typical dinner of conversation, often quite the opposite. However, deeply rooted in my experiences and family history is the concept of accountability, in particular, the philosophy of doing what is right. This was a value I learned at home and during my Jewish education. I have now practiced emergency medicine for over 30 years since starting my residency at Henry Ford Hospital. 25 of those years have been at Grady Memorial Hospital as Emory School of Medicine faculty. During that time, my colleagues, friends, and patients have taught me that doing the right thing means understanding and striving to promote diversity, equity, and inclusion. Through mentoring of countless students, especially the strong relationships that we have built with Morehouse School of Medicine, I have held myself accountable to do the right thing, constantly striving to increase diversity in emergency medicine and establishing equity among all of our students. Dr. Ander, my white Jewish tall male who I went to his family's bat mitzvah, I learned about, learned about, about that, it was amazing. But we need allies people who will step up and step in, because equity matters. We see this across ACGME, whether it's increasing our workforce diversity, building this inclusive learning environment, promoting health equity. As educators, this is on the map. And I have to commend Dr. Balhara 
and team who got it right. They got diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice in that order. So kudos to you as you thought about how we can chart ourselves to be inclusive and equitable on any of you days. And you made it very simple. You talked about being intentional. How do we create spaces that bring in and display that you are all about inclusivity? How do you consider what that space may look like? What language is displayed? What kind of language do you use in terms of gender neutrality? Do you ask your learners what they need and how do they move forward? Certainly as a researcher, the National Academy of Medicine also put forth this concept paper on how to consider dismantling systemic racism to advance the research agenda. Are we proud and are we bold enough to decenter whiteness, which has been the construct by which and how which we have conducted much of our interventions in medicine? And the commitment to ensuring that we do research to move towards health equity comes from the highest level. And certainly in our own house, where the good Dr. Coates, our president-elect, has already moved us forward, weaving in, integrating DEI in inclusive research. So we got what it takes here at SAEM. Dr. Mills had the chairs going through that at the AACEM conference to talk about the leadership that the chairs have and have had to move us forward. Thank you for the invitation. It was great to be there. So yesterday, if you were not at the SAEM consensus conference, research is real. We have to create that agenda. We have to think about how racism impacts us, our communities, who we serve, what we do. We learned how that has been set on the stage by the conference dedicated to social emergency medicine last year, where there was discussion on how racism needs to be addressed in the construct of what we are doing. So we are well on our way to determine how we can study this and bring forth the best evidence to combat racism in emergency medicine. And for all of us who are clinicians, still practicing or not, health disparities and health equity has always been rooted in justice. This paper, published more than a decade ago, talked about that. And while it has been talked about, I'm not sure it's been well socialized. And what I like most about this is what it talks about, which is the heart and commitment to address health disparities to achieve a more just society. So when we tie all this together, diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice, what we're talking about is diversity of people and perspectives, the equity that we provide in policy, practice, and position, the inclusion of all voices who will sit at the table to be able to render their thoughts and enhance your organizational culture grounded in justice and equal rights. Going back to where we started, I had to go look it up. This is our U.S. Constitution, written in 1787. So I looked that up only because I just came back from St. Lucia and I had to show my passport and actually had to read about it. And I said, oh my goodness, the Constitution says in the first five objectives, Establish justice is the first of five objectives. This is our Constitution. I don't know if they believed it back in the day, but this is what they said. <laughs> so this is what they said. I was like, wow. That was a time when, you know, remember that history? We were all slaves and all that. But anyway, this is what they said. So it's right there for those who may not want to get in the party, get in the game. So moving forward, I'll ask you this. Are we accountable to learning? how to be anti-racist. And for those who get icky and feel uncomfortable with the word anti-racism, just tell them we're about pro-health equity, right? It's all about being positive, pro-health equity. Are we gonna collect the right data? We've started, thank you very much, to think this through and think about it. Are we gonna lean in, learn in, listen in? It's really interesting when we talk about, people say cancel culture and all this kind of stuff. I, I don't believe in that. Loretta Ross talks about this. We gotta call people in, not call them out, call upon them. Loretta Ross, an incredible social justice leader, 
in reproductive health rights. Fascinating. So when you have naysayers, call them in, count on them, and have the conversation. We can't do it without it. So justice is really about what we want to do moving forward. We talked about diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice. Are we accountable? J is for justice. You see, justice has many faces, but she never wears a mask, unless you are referencing eye covering to prevent bias in her task. Sometimes we say that she's blind, which makes her hard to predict. Then it appears that she is blind to oppression after a verdict. But is that justice? Justice dons a robe of hope filled with possibilities of what has long been paid for or has yet come due. Like the first time two X chromosomes will represent the highest bench donning a deep bronze hue. Justice from a word meaning only and right would mean it is not defined by wrong. Then justify would mean to make righteous, to keep time and key in freedom's song. Wouldn't it seem supreme to court justice to wed equality with opportunity, a union that would bear children named equity, inclusion, and unity? You see, justice is less of a game based on genetic cards you are dealt, but rather a system with fair rules of life and liberty, especially in the pursuit of health. Justice means many things to most of us, but for right or for wrong, it's not justice if it's just us. Just us. So that's Dr. John Lewis. It shouldn't be lost on you. No relation uh, to John Lewis. However, he is at Emory. He is in Atlanta, where we know we had a man who was all about doing good trouble. John Lewis is about doing good trouble. Dr. John Lewis is also about doing good trouble. He leads and does a lot of work at ASAP on social justice. And he is an incredible orator and keeps us accountable. So in summary, I hope that we have defined what we mean around diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice. We've reflected on why it matters to you, to our organization, to our patients, to our communities, and more importantly, that you will hold yourself accountable and apply some of the principles discussed here to move us forward. So, 20 years ago, emergency medicine. Where am I, Emory EM Posse? Raise your hand, raise your right. There it is, there it is. The Department of Emergency Medicine at Emory, with my cohort and friend and colleague, Leon Haley, wrote this paper 20 years ago. So I pulled it out, dusted it off, and said, oh my, what do we talk about? And I looked at that and did a head scratch and said, wow, we talked about leadership commitment. I don't think that's changed. We talked about expanding recruitment and supporting the, rep the re retention of underrepresented students, faculty, and trainees. I don't think that's changed. We talked about addressing barriers to promotion for URIM and women. We know that hasn't changed although we have had some papers, thank you to Dr. O and others, and showed us that we can do better. We talk about mentoring underrepresented in medicine at the junior and high school level. That hasn't changed. So that was 20 years ago, so can y'all just step up and step in? Because Brother Haley's watching. And I have to tell you this story, because when I was asked to do this, I said, nah, hell no, I ain't doing this talk. And Dr. Haley tapped me on the story, and he says, Cheryl, you have to, you must. I am gone, but not really. I'm right here. And even if you put it in, that doesn't mean you're going to get to do it. And I said, man, you know, come on, man. You know how this go. So here I am bringing Dr. Haley to you, for you, because this is how we grow. Together, he's with my parents in heaven, because that's what I believe. Strong women of faith believe in the future and of the hope that all of you will hold yourselves accountable to this work as we move forward. Thank you.
Wow. Not only was that one of the best presentations, it's super motivational. Um, I think that I now will, you know, my goal has always been to be an honest person, but now with more with diversity, equity, inclusion, underscored by justice, I'm not gonna call people out. I'm gonna call people in and have the conversation and make the effort more. Let's give another round of applause, please. Come on, come on.